Hello and welcome to The Winning Mentality, the podcast getting the stories behind sporting success. My name's Charlie Bosco and joining me today is Ben Hunt Davies, who won rowing gold at the Sydney Olympics in 2000 after, uh, by his admission, two disastrous uh, previous attempts at the Barcelona and Atlanta Games. Ben, in his own words, got pissed off with losing and he and the rest of his crew decided that everything they did needed to be reconsidered based on one central question. Will it make the boat go faster? You'll hear all about that process today and uh, hear how close Ben and his team came to not winning, which he is honest enough to admit would have completely altered the course of his life since. We also covered the importance of measuring performance and not just results, the skill of time management, and the lessons uh, Ben learned in Sydney, which apply to all of us. Before all that, though, I started out by joking to Ben that we'd already had an Olympic gold medalist on the show, and we'd also had an ocean rower uh, rather than someone who only had to row 2,000 metres. He took it in good humour and then proceeded to give insightful and honest commentary on the process that's defined his life. I think you'll enjoy this one. Ben, welcome and thank you for your time. I know it's a Friday afternoon here in London. Uh, Thank you, Raj, for inviting me to to, to join the podcast. And um, you're not the first row we've had on. Uh, We had an ocean rower. And I was thinking, you know, also... Not the first Olympic gold medalist. We had a Paralympian uh, world champion in, in hand biking. However, you are the first Olympic gold medalist rower. So that's a claim to fame of a sort, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, and I think, uh, I think, I mean, uh, ocean rowing, where you're going to spend 30, 60, 90 days at sea. I mean, I think that's really hardcore. I only had to do it for five and a half minutes. It was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I've rowed 2,000 meters. There's nothing easy about it. Um. I've always wanted to do this with someone that's been through an experience like you. Um, and I want you to just, if you can, describe the day uh, you won your gold medal. When you wake up in the morning, uh, does it feel like D-Day? Does it feel different? What's it yeah, like? Yeah, yeah. Waking up in the morning, I remember, uh, I mean, we were up at 4.45, 5 o'clock or whatever time it was. We were up early and just... Why is that? Because we... Um, so we were, our race was 10.30. We wanted to do a training session before racing started. Um, and we wanted to have breakfast the right amount of time before racing. So we were, we got into the dining hall at 5, 5.30. I can't remember exactly. So we were, we were up early. And, and we had spent a fair bit of time before, um, you know, getting body clocks adjusted to it and stuff. And that's what we were prepared for. Um, and I remember at that time in the morning in Sydney then, it was pitch black. Uh, so you wake up, it is pitch black. It's clearly early o'clock in the morning. But you are immediately awake, and you just immediately know what what you're there to do. I mean, it's none of the kind of getting up and going, oh, what you know, what day is it? What's happening today? Just kind of waking up. The alarm goes off, and I remember just instantly going, "This is it." Had you slept the night before? Yeah, I slept really well actually. Um, some of the boys, uh, some of the boys didn't sleep at all. Um, it takes quite a lot to stop me sleeping. <laughs> so I, I had a great night's sleep, um, and I was sharing a room with uh, Luca, one of the other boys in the crew, and we kind of just woke up, swung our legs down, looked at each other, and gave each other a nod, of going, "This is it. This, you know, today is the day." Uh, having waited for it for for a very, very long time, um, and just being, yeah, immediately awakened on the ball and knowing, knowing, knowing what you got to do. Happy? Were you happy, or is it is it dread? Does part of you think I'm just driving to Sydney Airport and I'm going to fly home? I can't do this. Um, both, both. So, 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 so parts of the morning uh, and parts of the week before of just going. I can't wait. This is what this is what the whole thing is about. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what this is what we're here to do. And then part of the time thinking, holy shit! I just want to get out of here. I'm not up for this. I just don't want to be here. Um, and and having these massive fluctuations in emotion in the week and the morning of the final of just of just being shit scared uh, and then also just being so unbelievably up for it excited looking forward to it and and kind of swinging between these two extremes which are just you know far more extreme than you ever normally deal with and getting it getting the whole lot at the same time 
So you, you go down to breakfast and then you've got to... Well, it's not, I guess, you said a training session. I guess it's it's, it's a limber up or do yeah, you so like to go quite hard and get a good sweat on? So, so, so I, I mean, on the water we did, we did a kind of proper session. But, but you say, you know, you kind of go down to breakfast. So, yeah, I mean, we, we walked the few hundred meters to the Olympic dining hall. This is in the in the village. This is in the in the Olympic village, yeah. And we always sat in the same place. We had our routines, and um, and there was a kind of GB area, and there was a there was a table that we as a crew always sat at, and we sat down. And you, you, you know, the last thing you want to do is eat. All you want to certainly for me, all I want to do is puke. And you know, you've got to force some stuff down your throat. So I could then puke it back up because I needed to puke something up. So you're kind of struggling with breakfast. Everybody's just sitting there t- looking at each other, too scared to talk to each other. And along comes a guy from the British ju- uh, judo team, a Glaswegian guy, 52, 54 kilo weight category, I can't remember, pissed as a fart. I mean, he <laughs> stank, absolutely stank <laughs> of cigarettes, alcohol. And he just launched off into the story about what an amazing time he'd had at some some nightclub. And... And you're sitting there thinking, oh, my God, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, is he completely oblivious to what's happening around him? And, and so you go, oh, yeah, you just had breakfast. You know, breakfast was quite traumatic. <laughs> yes, it sounds like <laughs> uh, it. And then, and then walking down to the bus station, I think I puked twice before getting on the bus. And then I had to get off the bus, be sick again. This is just nerves. Just nerves. Just nerves. Uh, and then you get down there and you get, you, you get the kit out and... And we went for a training session, and it was, I think it was just one lap of the lake, but with some, you know, bits of intensity in there. And and it was really tense. It was really, it didn't have the dynamic, loose, fast flow we needed. It was kind of tense and tight. And you come off the water going, great. We got the tension out of the way. We know we can do that. That's out of the way. We've done that for today. Now we can relax and get on with it. And you're just kind of telling yourself the story you need to hear to get yourself on to the next, the next bit of the day. And yeah, so the training session was, I mean, it was, no, I mean, it wasn't particularly good. It was just tense. But did you know it was going to be tense and that's why you had it? Had yeah. you said before, we, we'll, we'll feel better if we get this out of our yeah. system? So, so, so normally pre-race sessions are a bit tense. Um, and, and you, you, you want to do some, you want to, you want to go through the motions. You want, you know, Kind of get 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 your kind of hand back in the stroke. You want to get the rhythm going. You want to get some cobwebs out. So you know it's going to be tense, but you're still wanting it to be a, an amazing session. And then we still had something I can't remember three or so hours to kill before we got our hands on the boat to go out to race. And we were there was a team GB tent that was probably I don't know maybe ten meters by ten meters, and there were the nine of us prowling round in there. I'm pretty big, well eight big lumps and. And yeah. The Cox. Uh, yeah, and and we were angry. I mean, we were really, really angry. We had lost the heat, which was a complete cock up. We we then kind of got through this the the repechage to get us into the final in brutal fashion, and we were just incredibly aggressive, angry, restless. Um. And people kind of poked their heads in the tent. One of the girls' crews who was racing came in and did their kind of stretching and stuff. And we were trying not to get in each other's ways. We were, you know, every five minutes going out to the toilet and coming back. Um, and and th- those hours of waiting, I think, are the worst ever. They just stretch on and on. And all you want to do is get on with it. All you want to do is be on the start line and racing people. You don't want to be hanging around for another two hours, 45 minutes, two hours, 30 minutes, two hours. I, the time just ticks past so slowly. And what, what's your mindset? Had you prepared for this moment? Had yeah. you, I mean, how had you um, prepared yourself mentally to try and uh, keep your head in the right space during those hours? And did it work? So, so, so we, 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 um, we're prepared meticulously. We, so we knew the exact routine we were going to go through on that day. We knew that the first bit would be tense. We knew the breakfast would be difficult. We knew that I'd be puking. We knew that, um, you know, that those hours before racing, at any race, they're hard. At any race. Uh, so, uh, and we knew that everything would be cranked up a bit more. And um, what we, there were a few key things we did was kind of the process. The performance. All you keep coming back to going. Actually, this is a, this is a piece of piss. Rowing is a really simple sport. There's one movement we've got to do. We've just got to do that one movement 240 times. That's all we're doing. The Romanians, 
the Croatians, the Italians, we, we've raced them all before. That They're in the 10 next door doing exactly the same thing. We're all human. We're all in the same situation. And all we've got to do is this thing that we've spent our life dedicated to. It's just one movement. That's all it is. And so we just kept coming back to the to what was really simple. And we had a, a, a kind of um, a sheet of paper with all the reasons why we could win. And there were times we were kind of looking through that, kind of just to, to reinforce yourself. When you're sitting there going, holy shit, this is the Olympic final. What am I doing here? You're looking at the bit of paper and go, actually, you know, I, I'm here because you know we've achieved this, we've achieved this, and I've been able to do that, and we've done this, and we've done this, and we've done this. So you've got we, – we, we knew how to get ourselves – engaged we knew how to make sure we were on the ball properly and but you know it doesn't mean it's easy <laughs> <laughs> so when you finally get the call the three hours is up and you go out to the boat how are you feeling i mean your legs jelly have you uh, heavy legs yeah. yeah heavy legs um and i remember the last still tempted to just leg it so yeah so so we got um we kind of finished our stretchy, you know, Maka, our coach kept coming and going, right, 15 minutes, boys, right, five minutes, right, let's go. Um, went out, we stood in the sunshine um, by the by the lake and um, Martin, our crew coach, Harry, his assistant, Jürgen, the head coach, stood around. Uh, we all stood in a group and Martin spoke to us for, I, I don't know how long. Uh, and actually, I didn't really hear anything he said. Because the whole of the thing, his talk, I was just going, holy shit, I, I don't want to be here. Uh, and the last thing he, the, the kind of thing that, that, that kind of broke through to me was he said to he said to one of the boys, what are we going to do? And Kieran said, we're going to effing do it. And, and I went, yeah, too bloody right we are. And, and, and a few of the boys would give me a bit of a slap. And, uh, and, then, and then I picked up the eight oars, flung them over my shoulder. The other seven boys carried the boats boat down we got in you know made sure everything was tight made sure everything was as it should be pushed off and I remember looking kind of down the boat to the bank that was behind us with a pontoon on our left and Harry and Martin our coaches were, were, were stood on the grassy bank and they were I mean they'd put years into this and they were there completely helpless and just the look of utter helplessness and I was thinking, thank God I'm in the boat because I can actually make this happen. I can do this. This is down to me now. Whereas they can't, they can't do anything. All of their hopes and dreams are wrapped up in what we do. And I'm so glad my hopes and dreams are wrapped up in what I do <laughs> rather than what somebody <laughs> else does. Uh, and we went out and we had an amazing warm-up. The warm-up was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Last, we kind of did a whole load of burst, 15, 20 stroke kind of pieces at with a stroke rate going up and up and up, uh, kind of increasing the intensity and speed. And the last one we did was the fastest thing we had ever done. It was incredible. Um, and rowing out onto the main lake, because this was all on a kind of side lake, you row out onto the main lake and you've got the Olympic course, stretching away as I was looking at it, the finish line down to the left, the start line up towards the right, and we kind of rowed up there in a few small groups of spectators in the top, top part of the course. And then you kind of... We kind of hung around a bit, waiting for the next, for the previous race to go down, and then you get in your lane and 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 you're just gagging to get on with it. Absolutely gagging to get on with it. Can you remember the race itself? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we we had spent. Um, so it's easy to let a race go and kind of go past in a flash, and you get to the end and you go, you know, what kind of where did that go? What happened? And um, through all the racing we'd done, through all the training we'd done, we needed to be aware of what we were doing so we could then review it properly and do it better next time. And if you if you just kind of get to the end of the race and go, bloody hell, where did that go? Then you can't, it's really hard to learn from. So you're trying to take it in. So you're trying to take it in. So we had a very, very clear plan. Um, it was kind of pretty simple. Go as, for the first 500, well, we wanted to, to finish the first stroke before anyone else. We wanted to be finishing the second stroke before anyone else. We wanted to be onto the third stroke before anyone else, fourth stroke before anyone else. And from the end of the first stroke, we wanted to be in the lead. And then we wanted to increase it on the second, the third, the fourth, the 15th, the 20th, the 120th. We just wanted to increase the lead more and more and more. So there's no Mo Farah kick at the end. So no. just get ahead and stay so, there. So, so we knew the Aussies had a great sprint for the line. They were... Um, they were really good in the last 500. Every time we'd raced them, they'd been faster than us in the last 500. 
whether they had been ahead of us or behind us at the time, they'd been faster. And we thought in front of a home crowd, home games, we didn't want to get in a fight with them. So the idea was to put 2,000 meters worth of energy into 1,500 meters and just get the biggest lead we possibly could. And in the last 500, the Aussies would come charging and we would grit our teeth and hang on. And 500 meters is a long way. When you're that 500 time, meters is a long way. And we went in just over three seconds up on them and we finished just, just uh, I think it was 0.8 a second up on them. They took shed loads out of us in the last 500, but not enough. Did you know you'd won as soon as you cross the line? Yeah. Yeah. So with you about, could see it visually or could yeah. you just sense it? Yeah. Um, so for most of the race, I was really focused on what I was doing. I think at halfway, I looked across and saw the creations and I don't, I can, there was no one else there. Um, and then... Sorry, were you in the middle of the so boat? So we were, I, I, was, I was at the, in the two seats, so, so near the front of the boat. Right. Um, so, you know, the Croatian bow was not far from me at half at halfway mark and, and everyone else was way behind. And, and then I kind of got back onto focusing on what I was doing. And then in the last 500, probably 10, 15 strokes into the last 500, it hit me that actually we were knackered. We had, I'd given, I'd, I've spent, I'd, I'd had it. Uh, and then everything starts to fail, including your concentration. I spent a lot of the last 500 watching the Aussies and everyone else piling back at us thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, um, and with about 10 strokes to go, I, I then knew we could win. But there was... 400 meters before that when I really I really didn't know <laughs> can you begin to explain uh when you when you know you've won it um so so crossing the finish line I had I think my first thing was just a sense of relief yeah of thinking we've done it we've not blown it we've just you know we, we, we've done we've you know, so much been building up to this point. Our expectations, other people had pretty low expectations. Our expectations were really high. And just thinking, yeah, thank God we've done it. And then as you get a bit more oxygen back to your brain, you go, we've done it, we've done, we've done it, we've, we've done the Olympics. <laughs> we've done the Olympics. And then you get a bit more oxygen back and you're going, it's the Olympics. <laughs> we've done the Olympics. <laughs> and quite how long it took from the... Um, just kind of the, the the sense of just relief to going, oh my god, we've yeah, we've won. I, I I don't know how long that was, five, fifteen, thirty. I've got no idea. Um, but you get this kind of realization, and it was it was amazing, absolutely incredible. It's uh, I'm looking at you now. It looks like this is ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't talked about it quite like this for a bit. Um, yeah, I mean it's. Um, was... Is the relief still there? Because uh, you know, I think we all look back on the things we've done and maybe got away with. Do, do you ever lie in bed and think, what if we hadn't hung on? What would my life look uh, like now? Uh, I mean, life would be pretty different if I hadn't done it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've been very lucky to make a career out of, uh, out of what we did. And 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 the the honest truth is that if it was an Olympic silver medal, you wouldn't would have the different. same credibility. Life would be very different. Yeah. Um, and and that's not in any way to denigrate a silver no. medal, but your business is based on yeah, it's based your, on winning, on winning, yeah. yeah. And um, and, and you know we were really lucky. I, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, we pl we planned incredibly hard, and we trained really hard, and we had a a massive um, focus on the detail and performance, and and, and if Lewis is back, that went kind of before the previous regatta, if that hadn't have recovered, we would have been screwed. If Harry, who was dying of cancer at the time, had have died, we would have been screwed. If there were so many things that that could have been different. And, uh, and you know, we had our opportunities. We grabbed them with both hands. But if other things had have gone wrong, I don't know how many other things we could have dealt with. A few more maybe, but, you know, who knows quite how many. So... You know, everything aligned. Um, you know, we got it wrong. We made mistakes. Loads of stuff didn't go according to plan, but enough stuff did. And we were... So, yeah, we, you need your luck. Uh, you do, but you also need the preparation. And uh, we didn't practice this, but you've teamed me up perfectly because I, I want to talk about how you got there. Um, you guys... Did, did you compete in Atlanta at 96? I competed in Barcelona and Atlanta, yeah. 
Uh, and I have read this, but you have to remind me your results. So Barcelona came sixth. Uh, Atlanta, we came... Which is still in the final, right? It's last eight, in the final. Uh, right, sixth in the final. And then in Atlanta, we didn't make the final, we came eighth overall. So what was the uh, conversation post-Atlanta? Well, what, what, where's the change from not making the final to winning four years later? So... Which I know is a big question. <laughs> no, so... so um, so 96, we did make the final. 97, I actually managed to get out of the eight because the eight is the bottom boat in the British team. I'd had enough in the eight. I didn't want to be in the eight. It was, it was shit. Um, I, so the next year, I managed to get into a pair because I thought, you know, two of us, we've got more chance here. We, and we came fifth at the World Championships, which was, which was really disappointing, really disappointing. The next year, with the same guy, we kind of did the trials. We did well enough to stay in the pair. And Jürgen, the head coach, said, tell you what, I want you to do the first regatta in the eight because, you know, we, we, we need your help. So we did that. And then he went, right, you're in the eight. And I was really pissed off. We were both livid. I didn't want to be in the eight. It was shit. And, and, and that year at the World Championships in 98, we came seventh. We didn't make the final. Sorry, just uh, for non-rowers, myself included, why, why do you dislike the eight? Why is it considered the bottom boat? Because so, okay, you're so. the smallest cut. Co- part of the chain if you know so so different countries prioritize boats in different ways so for years the british team looked at redgrave and pinson and we, when we got two people who can win an Olymp- olympic gold medal the top boat is the pair okay we got four people who are kind of all right we'll stick them in the four the next eight guys we'll stick them in the eight okay so so the americans go we want to win the eight the top eight people will go in the eight the canadians go we got eight people we'll do an eight the dutch go we want to win the eight so it's um it's not a worldwide thing. No, the the no. eight is not looked down on in rowing circles. No, for a lot of countries it is the blue ribbon right. boat. It's the biggest, fastest boat. It's just in Britain in the run up to the Sydney Olympics, the head coach decided he had four people who were capable of the winning. They went into the four. The next two ended up in the pair, and then those who were left over put in the eight. And I'd have been in the eight for I was in the eight a lot, and we lost everything. And I I didn't want to keep losing. I didn't want to be in the eight. And in 98, I was in the eight again and we came seventh at the World Championships and I was gutted, absolutely gutted. And, and it was after that that we started to change. Um, there were, kind of, we came away from that and, and for me, I was just, I couldn't face losing again. I, I'd been in the national team seven years at that point and I'd never won a race. I'd never come close, and 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 a load of the other guys. Everyone else was kind of younger than me. They were newer in the team, and they were going. They had actually done better in '97, and then '98 was a step backwards. And everyone was going enough. We got to change. And Martin, our crew coach, was a key driver in in helping us change. And we we became far far more performance focused. Um, in the main training centre, you go out and you do your. 20 kilometer session and you've got to hit a certain speed for every single 500 we start again that's rubbish what we've got to do is hit a rhythm we'll spend more time on the rowing machines and there you can monitor heart rate you know you can monitor your fitness much more closely than you can in a boat and in a boat which you're going to generate rhythm because most sport is about rhythm and timing and can you hide a bit in an eight you yeah. said you can measure fitness yeah. better on the machines. Yeah. Can you so, hide a bit? So it, it's, uh, there were times in an eight I found it really hard to get my heart rate up. Not because I was trying to hide, but just because dynamic with the, dynamically with the rhythm, it's, sometimes it's really hard to to work hard enough in certain training sessions. So we did more stuff on land to make sure that we were developing fitness and strength the whole time. And in the boat, uh, we were very, very... So physically, we thought we'd be the weakest crew in the final. We thought it'd be the youngest crew, and um, and we wanted to be technically the best crew in the world, and we were coming from being kind of not great, so we wanted to be technically the best crew in the world. We wanted to be the most resilient crew in the world. We wanted to be the best team in the world, and we kind of looked at kind of a whole load of different areas and thought which ones, you know, physically we thought we can improve, but we'll still probably be the weakest. So how do we make up for that and all the others? And so we were very, very. We were kind of ruthlessly focused on making sure that from every single training session, we were improving what we had to improve. We didn't, just training hard wasn't, wasn't going to be enough. And with the rest of the National Training Center, training hard was, is what did it. If you trained hard enough, you went fast enough. And for us, we went, we, 
we've got to change this. For us, it's just not going to work. So we changed our training center. We moved away from uh, Henley and we moved up to Hammersmith where we could do our own thing, set up our own culture, our own environment. And we needed to be able to learn faster than anyone else in the world if we were to improve faster. We needed to be able to, which meant we had to be able to challenge everything. We had to have really, really high levels of honesty. Um, and we we became, I mean, the rest of the team, when we went on our training camps, took the piss out of us for standing around talking so much. But we're going, it, unless we talk, how do we know specifically what we're going to change this session and how we're going to do it? And unless we review it properly afterwards, how do we work out what we're going to learn so the next session can be better? Because just training harder wasn't going to do it. That's a good insight, actually, because I think a lot of people, uh, particularly amateur athletes, just think, well, if I just do more, I'll, I'll get better. Or if I go faster, I'll get better. And there's clearly a lot more to it than that. Yeah, I, th I think that I think the easy thing to do, frankly, is to train harder. That's kind of the easy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, but actually kind of really analyzing um, exactly what the, 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 the kind of the minutiae components are so, so whether that be kind of physiologically, specifically what sessions do you have to be doing to improve your lung capacity, your explosive power, through to technically, exactly, you know, how do you make sure technically you're the best of the people you're racing? And, and it takes, I'm not particularly process driven, kind of getting into the detail, excuse me, frankly, I hate, but it's what we had to do. So we did it. And if we weren't improving faster in the session we were about to do than the Aussies had done a number of hours before and the Americans would do in a few hours, then frankly, we were going to lose because we had to be able to improve today, this session, more than them, which wasn't going to be working hard on them. The Americans were going to outmuscle us every single day of the week. So we had to outthink them. We had to be technically better than them. So, you know, walking upstairs. If you're walking upstairs and you can hear your footsteps, then you're just not being that coordinated. And if in a boat... Coordination is about how you push your feet off, push off your feet when you when you kind of put the oar in the water. There's a kind of degree of coordination there. So when you're doing box jumps, you know, pyometric jumps, if you're making a noise, you're doing them wrong. Because if we want to develop coordination in the boat, then we'll develop them on box jumps and we'll develop them walking upstairs to the change room. You know, if we want to be, be coordinated on our feet, let's do it everywhere. And we looked at, we got into as much detail as we possibly could about the small ingredients so that we can improve our performance the whole time. This is marginal gains. Yes, yeah, exactly what it is. Before um, Dave Brailsford and Clive Woodward. It's exactly what it is. Can you give me some examples of, of things you discovered? I mean, the famous example is Team Sky fly with their own mattresses and uh, Clive Woodward, I think, when England won the World Cup, um, famously got an, a vision coach and they trained their eyes so, so we didn't we didn't have we didn't have budget for for any of that stuff. Okay. Um, so it's stuff you can figure out. It's stuff we can figure out. So, um, uh, I mean, there was just kind of a whole load of. So sprinters do assist and resist training. People hadn't really people have done resistance training in boats, but not assist training as well. We actually get pulled along by the launch, so you can kind of practice going over speed. And we, I think we were the first in the rowing world to do that. Um, and is that um, for coordination rather than physical? Uh, so fitness improvement yeah it wasn't fit so we would do uh, resistance so we'd do a start with ropes around the boat to slow it down so you've got the kind of the resistance bit when then we take that off and then get pulled along so you've got to move much much faster so you're building power and speed of mo movement um and so i mean the whole thing about um you know say kind of jumping up and down quietly doing all that sort of stuff the the stuff we did on um on rowing machines with forced time curves was None of our competitors were doing it as far as we knew. Kind of looking really, really carefully at the false time curves. Um, the machine that most people use is this Concept 2 thing that you see in most gyms. And this was the days before they had false time curves. We used a completely different machine, which you could link up and have false time curves on. And we did all sorts of different exercises to try and change the shape of that. We could increase the volume a bit, which is basically your power, but increasing the changing the shape of it to make sure it's in the right profile for the eight was something we looked really hard at. Um, the uh, handle size on our oars, we were the only crew to have, uh, every oar had a slightly different, most of the oars had different handle sizes depending on how people, big people's hands were. So we could grip them more effectively. <laughs> it's incredible, but when you say it, it's logical, it's actually your only physical connection to the oar. Yeah. So, so, you grip it. so we, uh, I mean, it was a marginal gain exactly what it is. And it's not, it's not, you know, we all know about it. We all know that we should do it. 
But the fact is, most people get caught up in in working harder, and then they're knackered, and and actually having the the energy to step back and plan really carefully and to learn really carefully is the bit that most people miss out. Yeah, because yeah. either you 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 know for amateur sports people you're going right. Well, I got to get to work, so therefore I'll I'll just go and do the training rather than thinking. And for professional sports people, you might be going, I'm knackered. I'll just I'll just do the training and I won't do the thinking. And you know, then the, 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 in the national team, people would do two or three training sessions in the morning to free up the afternoon for different stuff, studying, working, playing golf, I don't know, whatever the hell it was. And we went, no, no, we, we weren't actually getting paid at the time, but let's act like professionals. We'll <laughs> spend all day doing it. So we'll have maximum rest between each session. And, you know, looking at rest and recovery was a critical part of what we did. And I think we were ahead of what a lot of other people were doing then. I interviewed a, a well-known strength coach and he was saying people come up to him and talk about, wow, well, should I do sets of eight on the bench press or sets of 10? And he said, I'll tell you what, do exactly what you're doing, but I want you to eat five vegetables a day and sleep nine hours a night and drink three liters of water. <laughs> and he said, and if you if you haven't improved your performance, we'll talk about how many bench presses you should do. And it's yeah. so true, isn't it? This, yeah. It's so vital to get the stuff behind the scenes right. The rest and recovery is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. Yeah, you know, power breathe. I don't know if you come across power breathe. Um, it was developed. We were, I think, the first crew to, first group to use it. Where you got a basically a like a um, snorkel valve uh, in your mouth, and you can kind of change the strength on it to 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 uh, work your intercostal muscles. You know, it, that was that was kind of new. Um, uh, and getting the sleep as well, and making sure we were eating properly. We we did we did quite a lot of work with the dietitian. I'm sure we could have done more, but we did. We did quite a lot. And it's just going, you know, all these different elements. Yeah. What are the gains we can get? And what was the, it might sound ridiculous because obviously it's an Olympic goal, but what's the motivation? Because rowing is so brutal. I mean, I, I, someone said to me, I don't like the rower, but I respect it. And that's how I feel. When I go in the gym, I I kind of think I should go on the rower. I figure that, I figure most sport is brutal. You know, whatever you're doing, you're doing it hard. But it's the savage, Everything hurts when you're rowing. From your well, your ass hurts. I don't know. <laughs> but I, th- I think I, I think you it's know, just maybe. the motivation to keep going every day. So, I, I mean, I, I I wanted to be a rugby player, and I wasn't good enough. Yeah, me too. Uh-huh. You, got a, you got a bit of an advantage on me about, <laughs> about a meter taller. Uh, yeah, I've kind of got some height, but I think you know I, I got to a point, and my both my rowing coach and rugby coach at school said, "Tell you what, go and row." You <laughs> okay. know, I, I didn't have many other options, but you know, I in rowing, I had a chance to be good. I had a chance to be really good. And and then you then I got into the British team. And so from the Barcelona Olympics, that was my first year in the national team. In fact, the year before at the World Championships, the pair, Red Graham Pinson, got a gold. The eight got a bronze. So that was uh, 10 rowers in the national team with world medals. The following year at the Olympics, the pair and the Cox pair, the Searle brothers, got gold medals. Four people in the team we're Olympic champions. Uh, and you go, this is not this is not that far away. This isn't something that happens to other people. If they can do it, and Steve and Matt are just mu- both much, much better than me. Um, you know, there are some people in there I look at physically and go, they're in a different league to me. But but why not? You know, why there's there's got to be a way. Uh, and at the Barcelona Olympics, there were two Aussies who won in the double skulls, who were, they were lightweights. They were racing in a heavyweight category and they were lightweights and they were Olympic champions. Not because physically they were the best people, because technically they were the best in the world. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about those boys going, how the hell did they do that? If they can do that, I'm the right height. I'm 6'6", six, six, I'm the right height. Those guys weren't the right height or the strength. I'm not the right strength, but I'm the right height. I can, there's got to be a way of doing this. And, and so the motivation is going, it's... You know, it's not impossible. And and also, you're in an environment where it's what everyone's doing. You're in a training center where it's really, really easy to train because that's just what you do. I, I was really lucky. I went down to Leander Club in Henley after um, I, I, studied, I rode for university for six months. Then went down to Leander Club, walked into the change room, and most people in there had been to the World Championships. <laughs> yeah. And then I was, then I was actually um, uh, coaching Oxford University women's rowing and they were really, really ambitious girls. They, they, you know, not in rowing, 
but they were kind of smart, ambitious people. Everyone down at Leander Club were really, really ambitious. People were really ambitious, and and you know it rubs off. It rubs off. You know, it's hanging around in the right environment. It's pretty damn useful, I reckon. <laughs> and um, when the day came, was it was it what you'd hoped for? Did it did it feel like enough? Yeah, yeah, it was plenty. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it was. Some people talk about oh, the anticlimax afterwards. I, I, I'm still waiting for that. Um, I had a really, really clear picture in my mind for years of what it would look like standing on the podium, and, and it looked completely different. And it was far, far, far better than I ever thought it was going to be. Had you given any thought to um, afterwards? I didn't want to make any decisions, and I didn't really want to think about it. Uh, I was getting married three weeks after the Olympics. And, and how I old was, were you? I was 28. Right. So is that um, towards the end for a rower? It sounds about peak Redgrave to me. Was, Redgrave was 38. Yeah, it was 28 sounds about your peak to me. Yeah. As a non-expert. I, mean, I, I was the oldest in our crew. And I just, I, I didn't really want to think about it. But I, I kind of thought I'd kind of had it, really. Three games. Mentally. Yeah, mentally. You were okay physically. I was okay physically. I, I hadn't really suffered much injury. I was, I was, I was, I was in all right shape. But just... My fiance, wife as she is now, I mean, isn't into sport. She just, it, it, uh, there was a question of, is it sport or is it her, really? I mean, you know, she didn't say anything like that. But, you know, the guys I kind of rode with, they're nice guys, but not not that nice. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, afterwards I thought, you know, it's just time, time to do so. There's so, so many other things in life to do. I wanted to I wanted to have a crack at some other things. And um, one thing clearly led to another. We're sitting uh, in your office. Will it make the Will it make the boat go faster? Yeah. Um, how did this come about? It seems like a fantastic uh, <laughs> business and idea from uh, all the reading of your website. So um, I after rowing. So c- kind of during the rowing, I was thinking. Um, I, I don't know anything about corporate development, but the stuff I'm learning here actually seems to be pretty damn useful. It is really making a difference for us. The whole performance focus bit, all, loads of stuff about change, loads of stuff about risk. I mean, there are loads of things in there about kind of layered goals, about bullshit filters. Um, it's got to be useful. So after rowing, I it took a bit of, took a bit of time, but I got a job with the training company, worked there for a bit, did my own thing for a bit. I then actually wrote uh, wrote my book, Will It Make the Boat Go Faster. Um, and then set up this business six years ago, and and it's been really fun. And we we work with all sorts of different clients, corporate clients, helping them make sure they're really really clear about the goals they've got, and then making sure they're actually doing the stuff to achieve them. And I think the name is absolutely brilliant, and it summarises um, what you said. Was was that your your theory, when you were looking at every training session, you're thinking, is this going to get us from zero to 2,000 meters quicker? Yeah, it's something we were constantly talking about. The way we're going to approach that, will it really make the bogey faster? Going out and doing this, is that really going to make the bogey faster? You know, doing it, doing this training session versus that session, which one's going to make the bogey fastest? Uh, the way we're going to have this conversation, me choosing to give you feedback or not. If I see something and I think you can do it better and I choose not to say anything, will will that make the bogey faster? Um the way I approach this team conversation, is that going to make the boat go faster? And we applied it to we applied it to everything. And and it's a great question. It's kind of really it's kind of sticky. People people like it and it's and it's kind of pretty damn obvious what it means. And how's it um how's it been received in the businesses you've gone into? And and have you found uh, that it has been as translatable as you thought it would be? Um, so we're growing as business every year. So um, yeah, that's a good thing. So yeah, we've got um, we've got ten employees, uh, soon to be eleven employees, uh, eight associates, and you know we work with lots of different organisations because it it kind of makes sense. Um, I, I I think so often in businesses people spend their time doing what's in front of them, doing what they're told to, rather than so many people feel as though they're not doing the stuff that actually really makes a difference. And helping people do the stuff that actually really makes a difference, really delivers what they're supposed to be doing, cutting out the bullshit, it, it, it kind of makes sense. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's sticky. For people sitting at home, have you noticed any common threads that you think would apply to just about anyone from, what you, from your, your six years doing this so far and the, and the years leading up to it? So I, 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 think there are, um, I think there are a few key things. 
being willing to challenge stuff, I think, is really, really important. Because um, unless you challenge stuff, then nothing's going to change anyway. I think that being really clear about what it is that you're after. Um, so when I go home this evening, um, kind of what, what am I going to do? Am I going to continue doing emails on my phone? Or am I actually going to really be with my kids? Now, if, if being a good father is an important thing, then presumably I should have that in the front of my mind when I'm at home with my kids, rather than something else. Uh, and actually, whether whether it's at home, whether it's in here about you know hitting the next set of targets we've got, whether it be about the kayaking I do um, occasionally at the moment, you know, it, it, having a clear direction, you can then make decisions about actually how you spend your time, rather than just spending your time doing what's in front of you, what doing the wrong stuff. So I, I think that should be completely applicable. Yeah, absolutely, and it's harder and harder with. In the, the world of phones and distractions. Yeah, it is. It's so easy to get distracted. But if we're going... And, and, you know, then I had one boat. Now I've got lots of boats. I've got a family boat. I've got my business. I've got um, you know, the sport I do as a hobby. I'm still involved in the rowing world. I've got, I've got lots of different boats. And, and, and just trying to go, so when I'm, when I'm in my family boat, am I really in that or am I still doing other stuff? When I'm in the business, am I just doing what I've done before? Or am I really trying to do the stuff that'll help me achieve the goal I've got there? So, so, so it should be applicable in whatever area, rather than just doing the family stuff badly and work badly because I'm kind of mixing the two, uh, and trying to separate time out. So I'm doing one thing really well, and then looking at, you know, rather than just measuring by results, looking at performance because results you go it was good enough. Whereas if you look at performance, you go, oh, yeah, I, I could do it better. And performance is internal. You mean? Yeah. You know so, yourself. So, so, so I know myself. So, um, whether that be. Um, a meeting that I've had with a client, I might go, I got a result, you know, they want to buy some stuff. But I might also come out going, but I just wasn't as good as I could have been. I could have been much more succinct with how I said this. I could have explained that better. It was good enough, but actually I can do it better, which means I've got a better chance of getting next set of results. Or whether it be about the conversations I have with my 17-year-old da daughter in the end of the evening going, oh, I wonder if I could have done that one better. <laughs> <laughs> and so rather than just going, I got a result, going, can I, can I do it better? Uh, and, and those things, I think, you know, sport, work, family, the, I, th I think they, they apply everywhere. That is such a good insight into life. It's so true. Uh, be clear, be concise. And, and, and then do the stuff that actually is going to yeah. take you where you want to go. And, and and even whether your goal is just to be, you know, have a smile on your face most of the time, or, you know, you know, there may not be a clear outcome, but if it's going, you know, I just want to be really happy with what I do, then then at least you know, so you can make decisions and go, well, I'm not going to do that because that pisses me off, and I'm not going to commute there because that pisses me off, and it, it just gives you, it gives you options so you can make conscious decisions rather than acting through habit the whole time. Okay, that is a fabulous insight. I'll be listening to this back and making some notes. Um I'm aware that it's nearly five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and, and you may have to focus on a, a nice uh, nice pint not too far from here in the not too distant future. But um, just to finish, we're 18 years on now. Um, what does the Olympic medal mean to you now? And although it's, it's, kind of it, it's kind of above the door here at the business, but on a personal level, how much do you think about it? How much pleasure does it, does it still give you? Um, I'm... I'm in a lucky position. I do quite a lot of speeches where I talk about it. And so I, I live it quite a lot. Um, a lot of the guys don't. You know, they've got proper jobs doing proper stuff. <laughs> and, and no one cares about it. But I think, I think for all of us in the crew, I think when we're having a hard time, when things are hard, we go, well, I, you know, I bloody well made that work in the past. And if we could figure out the solution to that, then we can figure out how to do this next bit. I think it's something that all of us, I think it gives us a whole lot of confidence about going in. If we, you know, if, if we figured out how to do that, if we had managed to get the right people around us, then presumably we can do the next thing. And I think, I think something, you know, we, we, we have a reunion every year. Every year still. we get together. Yeah, still. We get together and we talk about how good we were and, <laughs> and take the piss and, and and it's something that's really, really special to us. We were the, we were the underdogs in kind of 
in the whole lot and we and we managed to really exceed people's expectations and and I think that, that it kind of means a lot to us. Yeah, I can imagine that. It's, I said I'd let you go one more question. Is it almost um, a relief or, or, or in a way a release of pressure to know that, you know what, no matter what else I do, I, I, I won an Olympic gold medal? Does it, does it kind of take the pressure off no, in I other areas of life? Pressure. Really? Yeah. <laughs> People expect more from you. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to get to, I don't know, whatever age when I'm retired and think, oh, that was, you know, when I was 28 was the best thing. The only 50 thing years done. ago, yeah. I want to be, I want to do loads, loads of other stuff. And, and I want to, and yeah, people have got expectations and I want to, I want to prove a point. I want to, I want to be able to do other things well. And you can't measure anything against Olympic success. I mean, that's kind of different, but I want to do other stuff that, that I, I'm proud of. I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. That's, I have to say, before I came in here, I was a bit nervous. I was thinking, this guy's won an Olympic gold medal. I better, I better be switched on. So, uh, you do have a, I, I have an expectation for meeting you, and you will be relieved to hear you've more than made up for it. That, uh, particularly that description of the day itself. I will never forget that. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for thanks for coming to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you to Ben for his time and to the staff at Will It Make the Boat Go Faster who helped organize the interview. I'm doubly grateful uh, to Ben because we chatted on a Friday night, as I mentioned in the interview, and I'm sure he had places he would have preferred to be. But as he mentioned, you should give 100% to whatever you're doing at the time, and he certainly did that while we were talking. To learn more about his extraordinary company, check out willitmaketheboatgofaster.com. That's all from us this time, but we've got some amazing guests coming up in 2019, so stay tuned. Thank you for listening, and speak to you soon.